Hi everyone, welcome to the Memento Futurum podcast. This is Vanessa, your host. Uh, today we're talking with Victoria Cadnac, one of my dear, dear friends, and a little bit about Victoria before we start. So Victoria is a desert bioregional herbalist, wild crafter, and teacher in the Mojave Desert, specializing in native plant medicine and ethnobotany and a proponent of spiritual ecology Victoria aims to help people connect with their local ecosystem and foster deeper relationships with plants and the surrounding landscape. Welcome, Victoria. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm Very really excited. <laughs> Do we yeah. see this in place? Yes. <laughs> I get all giddy, all the fairy energy with the plants. I was feeling that today. I was thinking about some of our plant experiences with like fairy energy <laughs> we've had. Oh, we're coming out swinging. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to work them into that. Oh, man. Um, no, those are amazing. Those are amazing experiences. Um, okay, so but one of the first things I wanted to kind of invite into this beautiful conversation today. Um, first, so I would say just to kind of give a little bit of, of a background. So Victoria is one of my best friends here in Las Vegas, um, and I've had the privilege and the honor to get a lot of one-on-one -on -one with her in the desert and learn a lot about plants through her um, wisdom and her expertise. And we met many moons ago, this is 2018 at the Sekhmet Temple. And I didn't even know, some of my favorite plants now, I didn't even know by name. And she's responsible for that those introductions so it's a really really special near and dear to my heart um and go for it what'd you say oh uh i didn't say anything but i can okay. say something that's funny what did you hear i heard like a, uh so i don't know if it was just it's just me thinking out loud i guess it was my cat i guess oh my gosh <laughs> Yeah, but and so um, that's how it starts, though. I feel like so many of us nowadays in our modern world, and this is all of us, uh, unless you were, I guess, privileged to grow up with a parent that was, you know, a native plant specialist, you are in the landscape and maybe seeing plants like in your hikes, in your walk, all of the time, but then you can't name anything, right? And um, I have people all the time say, oh, in the desert, it's just like there's nothing out there and all the plants look the same. And for a while it does, uh, but once you have those introductions and start to build those relationships, then I, I think people start to realize how much diversity there is in any ecosystem, even, you know, the Mojave Desert, which is one of the driest mm -hmm. in the United States. Yeah. And so when we say bioregional herbalist, where are your regions of place? Like, where do you feel like you're you're really calling your regions, you know, my regions, uh, I would say the Mojave desert, just because I grew up here. This is where I have lived for a majority of my life. However, my training started in the Sonoran desert. Um, about 10 years ago, I had the privilege to apprentice in the Sonoran desert with John Slattery. He's an amazing herbalist. And uh, I lived in Tucson for a little while, like a year. And so that's where um, my native plant ethnobotany started was through that lineage and in the Sonoran Desert. But a lot of plants in the Sonoran Desert, you know, are also in the Mojave Desert. And so the main bulk of my work has been in the Mojave Desert just because I live here. But there are common plants found all over North America as well. And so yeah, I go different places and find new plants to connect with, similar plants to connect with, but the Mojave Desert is definitely more of my wheelhouse, the desert in general. Mm -hmm. Which I think is so special and so unique because, um, at least for me, when I see like online trainings for herbalism or I hear about different teachers, I feel like a lot of it is either Pacific Northwest or it's East Coast mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or, Cal or California, but like the desert plants, it's true. A lot of people look out and they're like, oh, it's crisp. There's rocks. And maybe what's that tumbleweed thing? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, like the cart, the cartoons <laughs> with the tumbleweed and the cacti. Okay, I think everybody knows 
like the cactus emoji right mm -hmm. but like that cactus is a specific cactus I think Absolutely. You know, and there's so many different types of cacti and some really cool rare ones that we have. Um, but I would say that cacti are not even like the most prominent plant in the desert. It's just what we draw in cartoons. <laughs> Right. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited because we have such an episode ahead of us with this. So you're a Vegas native. Yes. And I always like to ask these questions. I'm finding I'm asking a lot more about people's childhood. Somehow that's really interesting to me. Um, because like right now, you know, we're speaking as adults, but so much of the interest that we have as children and then as teenagers shape like what we want to grow up into or what we think is quote unquote cool or interesting you know Mm um i know a lot of the things that i do now are like the things that i would fangirl as a kid you know Mm -hmm. so i'm like oh I've, i'm growing into the person i want to be but i'm curious to know for you um with plants has there always been this like connection since childhood or an interest or like what was it like for you you know as a kid with this kind of subject So I, as a kid, it's funny that you asked this because I was thinking about this today. Um, You know, my family, we always went camping um, and I grew up skiing every weekend. So I was always going to the mountains, to the forest. And so I would say that I had like, I was always interested in the outdoors and then going into uh, college to university, my first major before I changed it was... um, like it was like eco related, um, kind of like eco science and sustainability. And then I changed that because I didn't feel outdoorsy enough. I was like, am I just a city girl? Which is so funny to look back on now. I didn't have that confidence, but as an 18 year old, I knew that I wanted to like work outdoors and that was like a part. Um, but one core childhood memory that I have when I was really little, I remember being out in the garden and my mom had these tomato plants And she was like pulling them up and she was like, oh, it's done. So, you know, I'm going to pull them up. And I'm like, and I remember being like, wait, you're killing them. And then I started to cry and I felt so sad about that. Um, And I think as a child, I was very sensitive, but I had to block a lot of things because I don't think I knew how to be sensitive um, in the world, you know, Pisces moon problems. Mm. (laughs) And, but that was very core. And even today as an herbalist, like, there's a lot of plants where you will use the root, like the root is the most medicinal like part of the plant. And I really don't like to take roots of plants unless it's kind of more like a tuber plant where I'm not destroying like the whole plant, like killing the whole plant uh, is still something I don't really like to practice, even though some plants die, you know, it's this, there is this cycle of death and rebirth that happens, especially with annual plants. Um, but I remember being very sensitive to that as a child. And I was like, so upset that this plant was going to die and we were going to like do that. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. First plant I mean, traumas. And no, I'm just kidding. Okay. So we're going to go from, I have like so many questions. So we're going to go from like childhood to really broad spiritual question here, but Mm -hmm. what do you feel is the um, connection or the function or purpose with plants, plant spirits on earth? Like, you know, where of the human species, at least Mm -hmm. most of us, I don't know. Um, The the ones that are talking on this podcast (laughs) might have have some human signatures. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to ask you what your thoughts are about like plants as a species and their own intelligence, like as like part of the soul Mm -hmm. of Gaia, like, what is that? I, I personally, I believe that, um, we evolved with plants and plants evolved to help us, to help us evolve into ourselves, to help us heal. I mean, plants, um, flowers, they have these medicinal qualities. They have these healing qualities that, you know, you and I have some history in beekeeping. Even the bees understand this. Like at certain times of the year, they'll go to certain flowers. Um, If the hive is like sick with mites, they will go to plants and flowers that have some of those like healing qualities. 
And so I do think that it, the plants evolved in their intelligence to help us become more intelligent. Um, and, you know, indig indigenous cultures around the world, it's like, how did they learn to do this with these plants? And if you ask them, it's like the plants told them. There is a plant communication that can happen, that has happened and can happen with all humans. Like you can receive these messages from plants um, for healing, for spiritual purposes. And so I think they evolved, you know, before us and kind of rose with us to give us that intelligence and help mm -hmm. to become, you know, for us to evolve into a, like our higher spiritual capacity. Mm -hmm. So like plants as sentient beings. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we know that trees communicate with each other through mycelium networks. I mean, you can cut down a tree and the other trees will still feed life into that stump so it can start regrowing. I mean, I spent a summer as a wildland firefighter, which was very scary. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I wanted, you know, in my path of like, I want to work outdoors. Um, not while the forest is on fire, but it was interesting. And I could see firsthand this communication. I had an experience of being on a fire in a forest in Western Oregon in the Siskiyous. And we were fighting this fire and it was slowly like burning up the mountainside and we were digging fire line and I paused to kind of like take a breath and there was no wind, but the trees, as the fire grew closer, all started dancing like this great, they started like swaying and I felt like I was in a dream. I felt like I was tripping out. I was like, am I on a hallucinogen? Um, these trees are moving and there is not one ounce of wind right now. There's no helicopters flying over. And they started doing that. And I've read that trees can uh, move and dance and communicate in that way. And they were, there was a communication happening uh, as this fire like approached. And it was, yeah, it was a really profound experience to be able to see that and be in a moving forest when there was no wind at all. Whoa. What did I just hear? <laughs> hold on this feels very reminiscent of Fantasia oh I interesting I think it's Fantasia it's one of the older Disney shorts or Disney movies where there's the trees that are walking okay there's like an illustration there's a it's a cartoon like a it's a blip I don't even know where to place it at this moment I'm anyway. like I I feel like I know what you mean, although there are walking trees. Oh, wait, hold on. Tell of... us about that. <laughs> I, I'm like, where? I might have to look that one up. It might be in South America, but there's trees that like their root system is very like shallow and kind of above ground and they will move. They'll move like meters every year. <laughs> it's oh wild, gosh. right? The trees that's are amazing. So cool. <laughs> no, that's so cool. Okay. So tell me, hold on. I have to go back. So you were talking about this experience where you were, would you call it a plant spirit? Like you were, you were having a plant spirit communication, like you were receiving information from these trees in this well, witnessing. Yes. I, it was more just witnessing. And I realized like they are talking to each other, um, which I knew, you know, intellectually that could happen. And you're like, Oh, they communicate and send nutrients to each other, but to see them like move and dance and really have this like communication is like this fire is coming and luckily it started to rain on that fire so the forest was saved and <laughs> I'm grateful for that um wow. but yeah that that was very profound and I mean that was after my uh herbalism apprenticeship and training and so I knew that there was this communication but to see the communication of the forest like with not just with me but like with each other um yeah it was very profound and just like a whoa moment I just feel like we can take a page out of this plant and tree spirit you know playbook the feeding life to the stump bit Oh, I know. They all care. Absolutely. Yeah. And when I read that, I, it really um, echoed some things that I had experienced because, you know, being a firefighter, they are, if there's a tree that's like partially on fire on the top, then the protocol is you cut down 
that tree so it doesn't the fire doesn't jump and burn down the whole forest um and i was able like placing your hand on a stump like there are times where it's like you can feel the life within it and you can feel those messages still coming through and i was i remember when that happened i was like what am i feeling like isn't this tree dead but you know it is and it isn't it's all connected in life um and to each other which is a great metaphor <laughs> it is and i mean i feel like if humans can hear that message and and learn right about that intelligence um and apply it you know to life i just I, i'm just like i i'm lucky to know so many beautiful people that are like those trees you know and if i'm feeling dead are gonna breathe life into me absolutely when you're down and struggling um it is important to have that community and you, you and i talk about it a lot personally but not having these connections both to plants and the landscape, but also uh, not having as many connections to people, to family, to like a core tribe, uh, it does create loneliness, you know, and makes us feel that we are alone. And I think it really kind of exacerbates our struggles sometimes. Uh, we evolved not only with plants and animals and our landscape, but we evolved with humans in, as well, and that deep connection. And in some ways in our modern society, we've kind of lost some of that knowledge, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the isolation. Mm -hmm. So, which leads me to ask this question, like, what do you think is the benefit or what is, um, what is the wisdom behind connecting to your local bioregion or your local ecosystem? Yeah, so connecting, you know, in herbalism and like starting to get to know plants, um, a lot of people kind of get into Western herbalism. And so you're working with very traditional plants like rosemary um, or lavender, things like that, which I love. All of those are amazing. And that is an important starting point. But, you know, us living in the desert, those are not native plants to the desert. And they still have these amazing healing qualities. Um, but I think connecting to your local landscape is going to bring about an even deeper transformation and healing. And so when we're working with plants, it's to receive these messages and to help facilitate kind of our own healing. Um, but when you're receiving that from plants that you get to see every single day, um, you can see them change and grow you know, it's not just like herbs you're buying online. It's like an actual plant in front of you on this trail that you're able to connect with, that you're building like memories and experiences with that creates just like a deeper and maybe like more profound connection. And this is kind of getting into the philosophy of um, like spiritual ecology or deep ecology. And the idea of, the, I mean, spiritual ecology is all of our ancestors. It's all of, you know, indigenous people around the world who have had these connections with plants. Um, in modern philosophy, though, the Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness uh, would hate to be called a philosopher, I think. Um, <laughs> but he coined this term deep ecology, and he really started to, like in Western philo philosophical thinking, started talking about how connecting with your local region um, makes people as like a collective care more about that. Um, because we can hear in the news like, oh, you know, they're cutting down or burning like parts of the rainforest and that's bad. Like that's not a good thing. However, as humans, we can't um, give our energy to every single problem in the world, right? Like there's so much. And if we all start to connect with our local landscape, then we're receiving that healing, not just from the medicinal properties, but from that connection. And this connection can foster a society to actually start taking action and preserving their local landscape. Because I'll donate money to preserve the rainforest, but I don't live there. And the protocols for preserving the rainforest are different, like the steps needed are different from what the desert region needs because they're different places. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I, I feel like it, sorry, am I interrupting? No, 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 go ahead. 
No, I just feel like it brings up the, um, like what I saw when you were speaking is like how so many people walk through life and don't even know their neighbor's names. Mm -hmm. Like, who are these people? And you live right by them and you Absolutely. might see them drive by all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and to me, I don't see it any different, differently than the plants. Like it, it, I feel like it bothers me now if I don't know who the plant friends are that are around and even the animals too. Like Like I, I know. did it <laughs> cut out? Is it being weird? no, no, no. I hear you. No, I was just saying, I know I see all these birds. I've become more of a birder now. And so I see all these birds and I'm so annoyed that I don't know what it is. You know, the retirees, they've got it right. The elders that go out, <laughs> <laughs> they've, got, they've got the life down, okay? they I absolutely like to do. wake up early. I like to go watch the birds, <laughs> go to Absolutely. bed early. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is some wisdom there. But yeah, like, why don't we know these plants' names? Why don't we know our neighbors' names? Like, I just think that there's a different kind of care and interest It's very heart based and it's very connective and community oriented. And um, I, I just I, I can't stress it enough that I feel like so many people. Um, I, I see so many people struggling, you know, in my work and in, in service, it's like they're struggling and they really want things, but then are not willing to um, say hi to their neighbor. Mm -hmm. Yes. it's a little weird they think it's weird or it's too vulnerable or they don't want to make eye contact or something Well, it's hard growing up in this, in an individualistic culture or society because, you know, the philosophy is. of our society and an individualistic society versus a collectivist society is that pull yourself up by your bootstraps, mm hmm right? I did this, I'm creating this, I'm healing this, you know, it's all very I centered, which means then there's not even a foundation of like realizing that you're supposed to rely on the collective because we've been told, Oh, it's gotta be you. And it's, what do I want to do? You know, it's like you ask a child, what do you want to be, when you grow up, what's your dream? Um, and it's never about like the collective and helping others and relying on other people. I know, I know, and I love to say it now. I used to be this person that would say that, like, pull my, you know, I did it by myself. I'm a, you know, I'm a boss babe or, you know, Mm that, -hmm. that kind of thing. But to heal that, what I like to say now is like any great thing that the I, that is Vanessa has ever done, I've never done by myself. Never. I've not done a single thing by myself. That's, you know, that I, that I find a value that I find that I would define as successful. It really does take the village and even just thinking like to raise a child to become an 18 year old. I mean, think of how many hands, how many teachers, how many hours the parents and the friends had to put into just one life. Mm hmm. to get that person to like adulthood. It's actually really crazy to think about how much It's wild. effort goes into that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like, but this kind of wisdom is not, it's not surprising me that it's coming in the context of the plants as the original teachers Mm -hmm. or, or plant ancestors, right? Plants as ancestors, Yes, the plant ancestors. you know, um, and like, I had to take a deep breath. I do this a lot in this space because we go so deep so quickly and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much yes here. Um, For the people listening, I don't, I'm just so, I'm so curious to hear your thoughts. So please let us know. Um, I added the cool little fancy send us a text um, feature on this podcast. So you can text the podcast now and, um, and let us know your thoughts in real time. Um, That's fun. yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> so it's more like a conversation because, you know, I am. I am interested in that. And even though you and I are here now, you know, there's always that shared third part of the field. That's, that's everybody else, you know, Of the collective, yes. mm -hmm. and just feeling everybody right now. Anyway. Um, yeah. So local plants, 
I, mm -hmm. I'm so curious to ask now, like your relationship, which mm -hmm. is different than my relationship or any, you know, cause I, I see this as, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, I see this, like, I see it all as relationship or relational, relational work, mm -hmm. like the way that I might arrive to a, de a desert plant. My favorite one is not favorite. I have a lot of favorites, but chaparral, um, mm -hmm. is going to be different than your relationship. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, in studying plants, um, like there's the common medicinal qualities. And in my training, we went a lot into the ethnobotany as well, because I mean, so many plants um, that are wild plants and not like, you know, more of the common ones, there is sometimes not a lot of science behind it. Right. And the science behind it is great. But then with the ethnobotany aspect, we look at how have other people around the world, you know, use this. And so you um, brought up chaparral, like a local favorite, uh, Lorea tridentata. And there has been some new science behind that recent recently. It's hard to find that stuff though, because then it's behind a research journal paywall as well, even if mm -hmm. there, you know, is that level. But chaparral or, you know, common name creosote bush is very interesting because um, it's thought to have originated in South America and then like slowly moved up into North America. And so indigenous peoples kind of from all over still use it to this day. Um, it's really good antimicrobial and for skin conditions, uh, wounds and everything. But um, indigenous peoples have also used it more internally as well. So for like kidney stones, menstrual cramps, um, even like things like diabetes. So a lot of the wisdom that we have from these plants that haven't really been studied in Western science come from like the local peoples and each. So there is, um, so to like bring it back to what you were talking about, there is what we know, right? And what other people have taught us. But as you mentioned, everyone's going to have a different relationship and different messages. And I believe that in working with plants, you also establish uh, like more your go-to plant allies. And that can change over time as well. Like there are plants that you're like, oh, I love this plant, but then there's ones that you're drawn to and you're working with over and over and you may have a deeper relationship with for, you know, months or, or even years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like my intuit intuitive and emotional sensitivity really started to open mm -hmm. when I started working with plants and I would I would consider myself like a I would like probably a folk herbalist like a, just, just like a your your classic you know household I use herbal remedies in my house kind of person mm -hmm. um I don't have any formal training but you know years and years ago at this point it's probably like 10 to 10 to 13 years ago you know so it's it's been in my world for a while mm -hmm. um you know, your common ones, lavender, like you said, rosemary, all of like just your kitchen herbs um, and and then making teas and things like that. But I want to say my path with the plants and understanding sensitivity really opened with the local plants. I would say same. <laughs> That's very interesting. But you have to learn, um, okay, so if we're talking about the common kitchen herbs, which I love, like, and in salves and tinctures and, like, blends, like, I'm always going to have, not always, but I, you know, a lot of the times we'll have some of those, like, common plants because they're great. They really are. But with those plants, you might grow them in your garden or you can just, like, buy them, you know, in bulk, like, dried online. Um but with that, you're more using it like, okay, you're making a tea or maybe a tincture and then you're seeing how it affects you. Whereas the native plants, it's like you're seeing them throughout the seasons. They mm -hmm. are growing there, um, but you're not forcing them to grow there. You're finding them. You're building a relationship where you are having to like go out into the desert or, you know, forest, wherever you may be located and seeing how that plant pops up in certain regions. Um, and then you start noticing patterns that you don't in a garden like oh this plant really likes um like sandy washes or disturbed soil or this plant is only growing um in shade uh or like for example cottonwood or desert willow that's like an indicator of 
water, like, you know, underground water and everything. Um, and so I feel like you really start to see those patterns and that's why you start to form those deeper relationships. Um, and then you start listening to those plants and you're talking about kind of this intuitive sense, but I feel like you have to deepen that because you have that relationship. And then if you are starting to wildcraft, then what is this plant saying to you? Mm -hmm. Like, and if you don't know this plant, what are your first impressions? Um, it's really cultivating a sense of how to listen to the plant before you even get to the making the tea and like, you know, making the medicine out of it. Yeah. Um, doctrine of signatures is what I hear mm -hmm. with this. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah. I mean, every plant has, there's so many different components to plants. I mean, there's like the common, is it an astringent? So are you using this for like drying? Like if you have too much water in the kidneys or wherever, um, perhaps stomach issues, astringents are going to help like tonify and dry. Whereas um, like an emollient or dismulsant is going to more soothe and kind of like bring water. Um, but this can go so deep because then there's also the spiritual aspects like mm -hmm. of plants as well. Um, you can also really get into the astrological mm -hmm. <laughs> aspects, you know, there it's like what archetypal layer, like how deep do you want to like go with it? And so like glow mallow is a local, desert flower which i love um and it's a classic like demulcent um it's cooling it's soothing it's calming um like what's on the mucus what's so demulcent demulcent <laughs> is um it's like soothing so like mucus membranes that are like hot or inflamed or dry mm -hmm. it's going to soothe those it's going to cool it down it's kind of like almost like bringing water it's like moistening and protecting that uh, and all mallow is like that. So I know that like your grandmother uses like garden mallow and everything. And so this is all the same kind of family, like Malvaceae family. Mm -hmm. um, and so medicinally, you know, it's kind of like doing that. I would say on a spiritual level, I use um, globe mallow a lot. If I'm talking more for like the aura, like I don't use globe mallow a lot, like in actual medicines. I feel like I use it... Um, more as like an essence and everything. And I feel like it's very brightening and it like helps brighten the spirit, bring in a lot of like maiden energy and like sunshine and everything. So there's so many different layers to the plants. And it's like, what medicine are we talking about? The body, mm -hmm. the spirit, you know, it can go so deep, as deep as you want it to go. Oh, we want to go deep all the time. But for me, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it brings in the conversation around alchemy and like alchemical states and like the relationship from spiritual to material and like body, mind, heart, spirit. And, you know, like just all of the layers that all matter, you know, mm -hmm. and specifically with Globe Mallow, you know, that is an essence that I work with as well. And what you described is is really what I've received from the plant. So I'm like, oh, wow, that's very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And in my study with Glow Mallow, she's always brought like, a, and there is like a more feminine thing for me with Glow Mallow, not to always genderize the plants, but there's something with that. But um, softening the aura, that mm -hmm. globe circular shape of the cup <laughs> and the container, you know, of the way the blossom is yes really is this as an essence and an energetic um energy when we take it i think it can really like open and soften the, our vessel like our our auric container um so i i tend to use it with people who who've been very spiky like or or are saying things like you know they've been in a lot of arguments they're very rigid you know, they, they have a lot of black and white linear thinking. I'd see. And that, I mean, and that does go with the medicinal of being like, you know, you said very spiky and like arguments. And so it's like the mallows as a whole, cooling, soothing, calming, et cetera. It's, exactly. It's, so, it's such a study. It's so cool. And what I meant by the doctrine of signatures was like when you're looking at a plant and like seeing what they look like and that being look a like. part of their quality, you know. Like I'm thinking of milkweed when you break it and it 
it secretes milk the milky sap and i know that like in south america there's so many good examples of this i mean there's um like vines and plants that look like a snake and it cures the snake bite <laughs> yes <laughs> it's so it's very uh wild and I don't know. And so it's like the indigenous people knew this um, doctrine of signatures was definitely talked about, like in the Christian faith as well. Like, oh, it has this signature that, you know, God gave it to help us. Um, but that's why in the beginning, as we talked about this, I really do think that the plants evolved to help us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. OK, so common example, nerdy mm -hmm. moment. I in 2020, I started to see a lot of common so thistle a mm -hmm. weed popping up in my backyard in my grass mm -hmm. and it was growing next to dandelion mm -hmm. okay so they're kind of similar and in 2020 i feel like i was going through a lot of different things obviously the world and everything was so wild i was struggling in my business because of the world but it mm -hmm. brought up a lot of like inner like comparison a little bit of jealousy like mm -hmm. that time of my life and i started to see this plant and i don't know i was just like it had a had a yellow blossom on it and i thought it was dandelion and i was like wait you're a, you're different and it has like a the leaves kind of grow out in a star like pattern and the leaves are uh spiky like they're they've got little tiny little thorn things on them so it's a little bit thorny and um I was studying this plant and I'm like, I kind of feel like you. And I had this moment of being like, huh, like common so thistle brings in mm -hmm. like the, the everyman archetype, like the common um, troubles that every person might have. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hmm, what's common about me? And like, I wouldn't say I'm like a basic B like energy mm -hmm. in, in life, <laughs> but, but no, like that archetypal energy has helped me relate and understand it so i'm having this moment with the plant and then i start to research it and look look things up and online people were saying it as an, someone i think did the research on it as an essence said that it was good for jealousy and comparison wow and i was blown away and i was like it's a weed right this thing that people are like get the weed killer out and get well, rid of it weed is just you know things that we think are nuisances in the garden. Weeds are just plants. And I hear you say that and I think, oh my gosh, what a teaching for life. Mm. You know, and like, I, yes, my everyday problems are like the weeds of my proverbial garden. <laughs> and like, how can I see them as medicine? Absolutely, because we get rid of the weeds, you know, um, and they are medicine. Like in Vegas, we have a lot of like mustard family plants, but there's, you know, all of that is great medicine. It brings like spiciness um, to the palate. You can put them in salads, mustard seeds. If you put them in your eye, like if you have something stuck in your eye, you can't get out, you can use a seed uh, in your eye and it'll bring it to it. I mean, there's just so many different uses, but we spray them. We're like, oh, it's poisonous. Um, mm -hmm. They say that the you know, if a plant is popping up like around you in your yard, then it's a medicine that you need. Is the and that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. Is saying, and it's funny now that I think about it. I remember, like probably around 2020, I I knew that, and I had this like weird little plant pop up, and I was finally able to identify it as a euphorbia um, plant, and it was like cancer weed. And lo, and I was like, what is this for? And lo and behold, that's when this little bump appeared by my eye, which was skin cancer Whoa. that I found out years later. And I was, and I kind of was like, oh, it can be used for that. It can be used for like weird skin things. And I was like, I'm not going to put this by my eye though, because if it gets in it, it's like super poisonous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, and I was like, what is this trying to tell me? I guess it's just random girl. That was not random. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I mean, for the record, I'm not saying that we think, I think that we should just like deal with all the weeds, but it's like, you know, because at a certain point, we mm -hmm. need to take we need to take care of things and create solutions for things. Absolutely. But like, just how damaging um, weed killer is pesticide pesticides, insecticides, and planticides, whatever they called planticides. Is that a word? 
Did I make that up? Plant herbicides. 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 Mm-hmm. Those things. <laughs> I'm sometimes I invent words. Um, but how damaging they are for Oh, everything. Everything. Ourselves. I mean, the they're finding that these pesticides are like in our bodies, like at very deep levels can make you sick like years later and they collect, you know, it's kind of like this forever chemical type of thing. Um, They damage all of the insects, the butterflies, the bees. And it's sad because pulling weeds, it's not a fun time. Like I get it. It's a tedious chore, but then when I've had to pull weeds, it's like I, you know, I get to be outside and working with my hands. And even if I'm pulling up these weeds, as I said, a lot of them can be used medicinally um, if you haven't like been spraying them before and everything. And then it's also like connecting with your yard, like how privileged and ridiculous of us to live in a house and have a beautiful like yard and a space to tend and to be like so upset about it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just a, I think pulling weeds is a moment to connect deeper with our local little landscape. Like we have this house and it's something to be grateful for. And we are the people to tend the yard. Mm -hmm. I love the opportunity to pull weeds, which sounds silly sometimes, but when my yard becomes overgrown with weeds, it's clearly that I'm not taking care of things well. Mm Mm-hmm. And an invitation to slow down. Yes. And so I always like to pray with each weed that I pull and like think it's life and like pull it because it's helping me to pull something out too. Yes. You know, like whatever the thing is that's starting to become overgrown inside me. You know, but I think that this is this is why I think this conversation with you is so beautiful and why I invited you on because you have such a gift for um bringing this out in people like the natural world and this like beautiful instinct and like your your attunement to nature not only as nature by itself but as part of us and that we are nature you know like that's something that you really carry as a person well thank you girl and that's what I just want to I I feel like that's the message I would like to impart always to everybody um That we, as you said, our nature, and sometimes you hear people and they're like, we destroy everything like around us and humans are so toxic and we're not, we are a part of nature and we do change landscapes and we can do that mindfully if we come together and understand our landscape and build those relationships. And the more that we know our local plants and can connect to it, even the weeds, as you said, like viewing it as the metaphor for the self, like these are things I'm pulling up out of myself and being grateful for that. The more we can um, do that and connect to it, then the more attention and care we are giving to our local landscape and like any relationship that brings so many benefits. Like the more you foster um, a relationship with a human, for example, and the more care and attention you bring to it, then the more you receive from that you know, the stronger that relationship is and the more benefit you start having, like it's this sacred reciprocity and balance. And it's the same thing with nature. It's the same thing with plants. Like the more care and attention you give to it, then you're receiving so much transformation and healing and like wisdom in return. Yeah. Which brings up for me, like when we are engaged in this relationship and create friendship around these relationships, Mm -hmm. like you and I have such a strong friendship because we both love plants. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like it's a core part of our friendship and going out and exploring and the things that you've taught me and the conversations that we have and, you know, me sharing on essences usually, but like tea in the desert. So Victoria introduced me to the jet boil. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. The sacred jet boil, (laughs) the sacred jet boil camping girl here. I was so mm, rewind. Mm, pre 20 let's say pre 2015 I'll put that there I was like very scared of the outside world <laughs> <laughs> like oh no there's a bee coming you know and then that relationship I was working on that I was working on that 
And then here comes Victoria in my life as a friend. And she's like, I like to be outside. And I was like, oh, this is really going to test me, but I want to be her friend. So, um, <laughs> and I like to be outside, but there were certain things. I'm like, oh my gosh, what if I find a spider? Like just irrational craziness in my brain, you know, just like whatever my, these are my, my little neurotic things. And so that work that are, I don't think are as much of an issue now, but you know, would come out and she just has this like calm, cool, collected personality. She's like, Oh, I don't know. I don't care. And it'll be fine. And I'm like, I guess it'll be fine. That's an option. <laughs> it will be fine. Um, and it's been more than fine. It's been beautiful. Um, but yeah, the sacred jet boil. So like getting to go out when the weather's nice here and like, hike out walk out whatever i'm not necessarily doing too much high elevation hiking with her um but you know we, we get in there we get in there um but the tea outside is like one of my favorite things that we do together I agree. I love like, you know, having tea out in nature. It's so calming and beautiful. but like having friends that do th these kind of things like i'm not distracted with all the other blah blah of the world and like You know, like the the trip ups and like the, the sticky discussion things that you can get into or the go like gossip or whatever, like that kind of those kinds of relational ways that people can be with friends. Yeah, that's interesting. You're right. And it's like, it's so easy to fall into that. But that's why I think plants um, and nature take it deeper. And the one thing I love about nature, like the wilderness, getting out, you know, as we do into like, you know, deeper nature um, is that you can project your ego onto nature and it does not care. It does not matter. If you go out into nature and you're like, oh, I'm a teacher or I'm a healer or whatever it is. I mean, that's just you speaking. <laughs> to nature, which is all, which is the teacher and the healer. And, you know, whether you're a mother or a father or, you know, all of these things are just identifications. And in nature, that all kind of goes away. It'll just reflect back to you what you are, but it doesn't matter because uh, when you're out there, it's kind of like what really is important is you and your connection to all of that, you know, and your connection to the plants and the landscape, because I mean, in a survival scenario, if anyone was ever in that, that's, what's going to um, get you through that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't, you know, matter how much money you have or anything. And so going out into nature to meditate and to have these deeper discussions with the self without all of the noise um, and with the ancestors and like, you know, these elders around us, I don't know. It just, it takes us out of that. Um, and when you do it with friends, I think it just creates kind of this like sacred container that is hard to get like in the city, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the constructs of what we've built. Yeah. It gets you out of the buzz and really mm -hmm. recalibrating with what's true and like the, what I call, you know, maybe original self or, you know, that deep heart space and, um, It always, for me at least, it always helps me remember what really matters to me Mm -hmm. and um, to keep that at the forefront of what I do and my service and how I'm, you know, in any role with my family or whatever, but like, you know, plants and nature as, as teachers. Yes. Um, and teachings. The thing that my back of my brain wants to go back to is the seasons you mentioned a couple times and i want to say here how watching the plants change and what they look like season to season has grown me and mm. given me a lot of grace i remember you saying this a few years ago i don't remember with which plant um it it's very silly but this is how in this moment how you, if you can see my disconnection that plants are going to look different season to season hello. Um, but I didn't really think about it in the plant way. And mm -hmm. I think in a transpersonal psychology lens, of course, people are different, quote unquote, season to season of their life. But this took me really deeply. And I don't remember which plant you were talking about. I want to say it was something in Red Rock, maybe like Yerba Mansa or the wild rhubarb, something. I want to say that's where my awareness puts it. Okay. 
and um, like getting to watch the plants over the seasons. And so Victoria says a lot. She talks a lot about planting seeds. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> just we'll just plant a seed you know um actual seeds and then you know in the conversation this was a seed planted and it grew for me because seeing um specifically uh the rare really it's rare mojave indigo bush Mojave mm, indigo yes season to season i thought was like a tumbleweed i'm not even kidding in like because the fall it, yes it does look like that right It's very dry and a little bit scraggly. And you're just like, oh, what is this? And it can make you, those kind of plants, for me at least, it can make you not care that much. It's not that interesting. And then in the spring, it has the most, like, almost fluorescent-like indigo blue flower on it. It's it, it just totally changes, like, the landscape. It's such a bright pop of color, especially when you're on... Um, like down in Henderson or that south side of the valley with all of like the lava rock, like the the landscape down there is very dry and the rock, So different. um, it's Mm -hmm. so different. Yeah. And it's very like gray lava rocky. Um, and then to see this, like just this deep, but bright somehow like indigo blue, it's, oh, it's wild. The Mojave Aster, like that electric purple out there. That I one's love beautiful that. too. Yes. Yeah. So it's moments like this where like working with plants, this is what I mean by working with plants. It's just like having an awareness. Mm -hmm. Just what? You know, it's just like it, it rocked my world. I'm like, wow, that was that quote unquote plant that I thought was kind of ugly. And then it's it's a beauty in another season. And for me, you know, really working with people and like the psychological and the internal landscape. I mean, it's such a beautiful teaching, like having so much grace for the different phases that we go through and and how things you know bloom in different timings and different seasons and just like the whole thing i think if anything living in the desert has taught me that um like our bloom season here is really like fall and some spring yes yes where absolutely where other places it might be more like spring summer mm -hmm. and and like our winters are different miles compared to other places so i don't know it's just like i think the contrast is what i'm saying of um what i think a lot of how a lot of people around at least the country what they experience and what we experience here has given me a lot of insight into yeah and, myself and into yourself and then yourself as someone who's living in the desert right now mm -hmm. i mean you just mentioned like our blooms are we have a fall bloom and a spring bloom and um seasonal affective disorder you know for most people around the country is in the winter time where they're depressed there's not any sunlight but for peoples of the desert that happens more in the summer because it's so hot it's like too hot to really go outside and do that much and so now as we're finally right now starting to experience this cooler fall weather um, I feel like there's almost like a second little rebirth that happens like everyone's excited to go out and It's not like, oh, I want to be cozy just yet. Um, there's kind of a, like, yeah, there's a calming down, like, in preparing for winter. But there's also, like, I even feel in my own life, like, a ramping up of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A bloom, you know, a metaphorical bloom of things that I'm doing before, like, the cold winter hits, which for us really isn't until, like, January, February, I feel. Yeah, which kind of goes into like, so if you're a person who studies the the perhaps Celtic wheel of the year and you celebrate mm -hmm. in that way, or if you have other practices, um, this is why I love your perspective and you really bringing in like the local bioregion um, conversation because where you live matters and it matters for a lot of reasons, but especially your spiritual practice. Yes. And how it influences you. I feel like that should be like the motto of all of this. Where you live matters, everybody. <laughs> okay. Episode title. We already did it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where, but it's true. And then it, it makes you care about the people around you. And like, you know, they say peace is an inside job, you know, peace begins mm -hmm. with me mm -hmm. um, personally, but then like how I create peace in my home and my local, you know, network my extended family, my community, whatever. Um, 
so I think that this, that's why I say this conversation, I think is so deep and it goes many places, not just about the physical plants and medicinal qualities, though that's a big part of it. You know, um, there's a lot of philosophy and a lot of, um, and not like armchair philosophy. This is like, you know, boots on the ground, really app, app, applying Mm -hmm. the teachings, you know, to your life and coming back to what feels like an original human blueprint. Yes, of working, you know, of having deeper relationships with everything around you. Mm -hmm. And not just viewing, oh, it's just a stream. It's just a rock. It's just like a random plant. It's like there is a spirit um, in that and there's a message. And it's our human birthright to like know how to listen to that. Like we can all tap into this. There are messages from the plants and anyone can understand that. Um, it's just about like learning how to listen. This wisdom is something that I read when I was at Ash Meadows, a place that we've been together. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Ash Meadows uh, Wildlife Refuge out in Amargosa Valley. It's about like um, two and a half hours from, no, like two hours from Vegas. Um, but there is a sign there that says that the Nuwuvi people, which we call Paiute, but they call themselves the Nuwuvi people, um, say that every body of water stream a lake whatever every single body of water has a name and they know them by name wow and gotcha. it gave me chills when i read it and it gives me chills now because like knowing the name of that sacred being is really important to me um and that spirit and what they have to say and those messages you're talking about so anyway just you know putting that here in this conversation and um if you are in the the area in las vegas and or a person who wants to travel there i feel like it's something to check out ash meadows for sure it's so beautiful they have these it's it's um a place where they have a bunch of endemic species like so they the meaning they don't happen anywhere else in the world um plants there's a rare butterfly out there there's um different um birds so there's and the pupfish pupfish are like the main um piece well, not main, but there's like a, a core piece with the, the waters there. But then they have these hot springs, which are protected. You can't go in them. Um, but the the colors are radiant. And it's it's such an experience being there. I don't know. It really, I, I receive a lot. It's very spiritual for me every time I go there. Um, yeah, the turquoise blue of those waters is just amazing. I know. And it reminds me, it's like there is life. There is water in the desert. Mm -hmm. You just need to like know where to go. Um but anyway, so this whole conversation has been really exciting. I think we're coming to a close. Um, how can we connect with you? Do you have upcoming um, events or things um, in your world? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, so I have, um, I'm starting my, I, I'm starting to bring more herbal products like out to the world instead of just to myself. It's a message that I've been receiving in the past few months with like my work with plants. Um, and it's like, ah, you've actually got to do this and get this out there more. Um, so I'm founding Divine Life Botanicals um, to start working in that way. And yeah, I am going to definitely start some mentorship classes for building deeper relationships with plants. Um, and then you and I, I know are doing the uh wellness market as well mm -hmm. in december yeah. mm -hmm. we'll be at page and rye in downtown Summerlin, um december 7th from 9 a.m to 2 um alongside our amazing friend jillian christian and we'll have a holiday what we're calling holiday wellness market so we'll be like a variety of different products um handcrafted by us um and I could talk a little bit about that in a minute, like what those are, but to really bring a different energy to the holidays and there's a lot of consumption and buying and presents and all of that. But what if it can be, you know, gifting in a way that has a different focus or maybe can inspire or help, you know, ground people in their own practices. So, um, yeah, what, uh, what are you planning to bring there? <laughs> A lot, a lot of things. Um, I'm definitely going to bring some like herbal salves and tinctures. Um, 
each one I'm trying to have at least, you know, one wildcrafted uh, native plant if it's like going to be a blend. And so, yeah, I'm creating them all now as far as like what all of the blends will be. Um, I'll have definitely some like cold and flu elderberry like type oxymels. Um, and I might have some just like solo desert plant tinctures. It's something I'm going to have to feel into over the next mm -hmm. month, like what I think the collective uh, might need and might be beneficial. I hear you. I'm very excited to see what you're creating. Um, I know that Jillian is um, crafting like aura sprays and bath soaks mm -hmm. and um, together we're creating some teas and some candles. Um, I know for me, I'm bringing my flower essences, of course, I'll have some floral dyed clothing um, and I'm forgetting one thing handcrafting some incense very excited for this and mm -hmm. to bring that and I have a really special agua florida that I'm you know it's a type of like blessing water that I'm um, crafting and then the one thing that I'm really excited like super excited that we're doing together is a uh, you could call it an agua florida or like an aura spray that guys brings in the rain smell you guys know that classic desert rain smell um so architecting that and really bringing that in so you know because we're all we're we're three ladies from the mojave and so it was important to weave something that was local here um mm -hmm. and get people to experience that so yeah excited for that and then we'll also be at the rita dean and abbey museum we're doing an event in collaboration with the museum on november 3rd it's a sunday 11 a.m to 1 it's called nature as muse i'm very excited for that one yeah we're weaving um, live instrumentals based on the elements and nature um, with live poetry reading from rita's text um, seeds yet ever secret and um, I think that'll be a really, really fun time. And we'll also have some tea for you. Um, so yeah, I will link all the things below. Anything before we close? No, I think, um, I don't know. I'm grateful to be on the podcast. I hope more people become interested in Mojave Desert plants. And so, I mean, I wish I had a the social media to give out, but I'm not on social media right now. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think this is going to open uh, the door to more plant things um, with you and I and Jillian and hopefully more people, you know, feel inspired to get out and just hike and like learn more about their local landscape. You're on the social medium of the desert. The social medium of the desert. I love that. Exactly. That's um, where we can find you. Exactly. On the trails. <laughs> I love it. Um, all right. It's been such a blessing. Thank you so much for saying yes and for doing this with us and sharing all of your wisdom. I feel like I'm just like thinking about it and I'm like, wow, y'all just received like some class A desert um, local bioregional um, instruction. Like, wow. And um, it's just such a such a blessing. And um, yeah, we'll talk soon, everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Bye.